Okay, um, this talk is generally titled uh, Texas Prairies in, on Historical Perspective. And I have certain goals that I like to accomplish when, I'm, when I make a talk like this. And one of them is to, is to help people see prairies in a new way and possibly to th help them think about them in new ways. Also to provide uh, food for thought, not only for a lost ecosystem, but a lost heritage. I'd like to think I'm uh, a naturalist, but I'm also a historian as well. Now we preserve old buildings, we preserve uh, documents, clothes, uh, but we don't preserve ecosystems in the same context. And if you really want to understand people from a historical perspective, what you have to do is you have to understand their relationship to the land. Uh, if you don't do that, you're really not going to have a clear picture understanding of um, what made those people make the choices that they did. Why, they, why did they do that? I mean, sometimes we, we scratch our heads and say, that's such a crazy thing. Why would they do? Well, a lot of times if you, if you understand their relationship with the land, you can understand what motivated them to do some of the things. It's not always what we think in our particular standards. There's another thing that I need to make real clear is uh, I don't consider myself an expert in, in anything. Uh, 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 there's a lot of people that know a lot more about prairies than I do, certainly. One thing I do know is that I am an interpreter, and 90% uh, of interpretation is provocation. Uh, and what I try to do as an interpreter, I don't know other languages either, uh, but I try to take complex subjects and make them understandable and try to describe them in meaningful terms. If I can get somebody to uh, understand something, then I can get them to appreciate it. And if I can get them to appreciate it, then what I can do is I can get them to conserve it. And if I can get them to conserve it, then we're also talking about preservation. So if I can provoke somebody to think about something a new way, a different way, I'm going to say some things I hope that you'll go, now wait a minute, I'm not so sure that's, that's right. Uh, and if that's the case, then that means good, because you probably go and find out whether that guy was just blowing smoke or not. And I'm all right with that as well. Quite a few years ago, I started doing a talk like this, and it's morphed over time. But uh, uh, when I was going to do it one time, a person asked me, uh, well, do you need visual aids? At the time I started doing this, we were doing slides. Uh, no PowerPoints then. But uh, I said, no, no. I, well, no, are you sure? They insisted. They insisted that I should have some sort of visual. Well... I would love to have a visual, but the problem was is that I can't show you what a prairie looked like 200 years ago. I could, I could put some pictures up on a screen and they might look a little bit like a prairie looked uh, 200 years ago, but would they... Would it be that? Could I honestly stand there and tell you, this, this is a prairie? Uh, no, I couldn't do that. And I, I wasn't going to be that disingenuous or dishonest with people to, to say this was a prairie. Um, before I go too much farther, I'm going to get a little ham, ham bone here. Uh, uh, I had a little thing, some ideas, some thoughts that I wrote down I want to share with you. Uh, and it's, a, it's an essay of sorts. Uh, starts like this. I walked out onto the prairies the other day, and I had the place to myself. Even though at the park, uh, people bustled uh, here and there going places, the wind gently blew the tall grasses and made them seem to roll like waves on an ocean. Prairies are windy places, and I could hear the wind rustling through the grasses and was encompassed by the sound of the world turning. Uh, what a wonderful feeling that was. And I looked in one direction, and then I saw a fence line and a barn. In the other direction, I saw a park road. It led me to try to imagine what the world would be like when all the prairies were gone. Would anybody even notice? I recall playing on the great fields of tall grass as a boy growing up on the coastal prairies. Big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass. I didn't know their names. It didn't matter. They were my friends. Uh, the prairie was my playground. It didn't embrace me as a mother would its child. The grasses towered over my head, and even though I was surrounded by grasses, I was set free by the openness as the sky stretched from horizon to horizon. I would climb my mountains, the pimple mounds that uh, dot the seemingly flat prairie and gaze out across the openness to the edge of the earth. 
Sometimes the grass would fold over into loops that formed open spaces in the center. And I would crawl along the prairie earth and pretend I was a pocket gopher or a wily rabbit. I could hear the song of the meadowlark everywhere singing and knew the prairie was his home and mine. The box turtle crossed my path from time to time, but I never tried to keep one as a pet. I wanted them to be free like I was when I was on the prairie. I would sometimes sit and watch the red harvester ants uh, coming and going along the roadways and wished uh, they would let me go inside their volcano-like mound and explore the tunnels and chambers. Sometimes the horned lizard would be there having a supper. On winter days when the grasses were all brown, I would sit and shiver waiting for them to come for the coming of spring. For the coming of spring. Little boys grow up, and I found myself occupied by other things that seemed much more important at the time. But every time I find myself back on the prairies, I recall those times of wonder and freedom. And I hope you had a place like my prairies when you were growing up. And I hope that you get to visit them from time to time. If you never had one, it's not too late. I'll share my prairies with you while they last. And I would hope that uh, people listening to this have that special place in nature where they can go and uh, share. One other thing before I actually start talking about the historical perspective of prairies is um, I want to talk to you a little bit about prejudice or bias. Uh, it's kind of a scary subject in these days and times. but. What it comes down to is we're tree people. We love trees. Trees are the beginning and the ending of our world. Don't cut that tree of our world. Don't cut that tree. Uh, that's a beautiful oak tree, so on. Uh, but we tend to overlook grasses. Uh, uh, how do you think the world would be different if we'd never had grass? Uh, okay, it'd probably be a pretty dry, dusty place, wouldn't you think? Yeah, yeah, probably would. Uh, I've heard people say, well, you know, uh, well, this is what I would say. I would say, first of all, there wouldn't be any bread or pie or cake or Twinkies. How come? Well, because they all come from grasses. Wheat, rye, barley, rice, uh, you name it. Secondly, there wouldn't be big animals that eat grass, such as uh, cows and buffaloes. What that means? <laughs> no hamburgers. Also, no cheeseburgers. And no Captain Crunch, no milk. Um, Adult beverages. Most adult beverages are made from grasses. If you think about beer or whiskey or scotch or sake or rum, they're all made from some kind of grass. Oh, and while we're on the subject, sugar, forget that. There is no sugar. Where does most of your sugar cane come from? Ah, uh, well, some people will say, well, it comes from sugar beets. Well, most of it comes from a thing called sugar cane. And guess what sugar cane is? Sugar cane is a grass as well. But even beyond all the things we wouldn't have, there's something even more important we wouldn't have, is we wouldn't have civilization as we know it. Something as is, something is fundamental as civilization we wouldn't have. And let me tell you why. We'd still be hunter-gatherers. Uh, we, would, we wouldn't be able to stay in one place. And when we started domesticating grasses, just like we domesticated it, just, <laughs> just like we started, hello guy, uh, just started domesticating animals, um, we were allowed, we enabled us to stay in one place. And when we stayed in one place, we could have our food provided for us because we domesticated these grasses. And then we could form villages, and then we could form a town, and then we could form a city, and we could form a state, and we could form a nations, for good or bad, because of something as simple as the existence of grass. I don't know that we could have done it without that. Every major civilization, when you think about it, had a grass to help get them started. The Asians had uh, rice. Uh, the Europeans in Africa had wheat and barley and oats. 
in the New World had corn or maize. So if you think, most of the major civilizations in the world had grasses. So uh, why is it that we would just completely ignore grasses? Well, they're shy. Uh, uh, they don't shout at us like trees do. Uh, people love trees. We love old trees. Uh, we may have even climbed down out of them millions of years ago. Who knows? But uh, nobody ever comes up to me as a, as a park ranger and says, Oh my gosh, how old is that grass? It's so impressive and wonderful. But it's not unlikely that they would come up to me and say, you see a, a stately live oak festooned with moss and say, oh my gosh, what a beautiful tree. I wonder how old it is. And then you tell them, well, that tree might be 100 or plus years old. And suddenly they go, oh, well, it's older than me. That's wonderful. Wow, it's even more impressive. Don't touch that tree. But nobody ever says, to, uh, oh, uh, ooh, look at that little blue stem over there. I wonder how old that is. Well, the truth be told is that little blue stem may be a thousand years old. It could be a clone of a clone of a clone of a clone. It started way over here, and over the course of time, it's moved over here. But it's the same tree. It's the same you know, plant genetically as it was a thousand years before. Uh, we don't get that, and honestly, on a lot of levels, we don't care. Uh, and that, in and of itself, is okay. Uh, because we overlook grasses, what we've done is we've succeeded in, in overlooking probably, in my opinion, the largest ecosystem in North America. And you think at one time, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but remember, I'm going to provoke you. Uh, the Great Plains, the Great Grasses, stretched from east of the Mississippi River in the, at the foothills of the Appalachians and stretched west went all the way across to the Rocky Mountains. That's a long way. And then take it north to the Arctic Circle and then slowly push it southward until it gently curves into the Gulf, Gulf Coast and the Gulf of Mexico. That's one big area. And it was all grassland, and it was all an ecosystem. And folks, for the most part, it's gone. 18,000 years ago, when the glaciers receded from the uh, last major ice age and left fertile soils behind, the prairies flourished. There were 1.4 million square miles of prairie, at least. Presently, as you may or may not know, 99.9% .9 of the prairies are gone. Uh, One-tenth of one percent is left, and it's rapidly disappearing. But guess what? We feed the world. And what's there in place of prairies? Grasses, wheat, and rice, and barley. So we're still growing grasses on that same, same land, but we just altered it. Now, what I want to do is I want to take you to Texas in the early early days before uh, the prairies began to alter too much. And um, I want to read to you what Mr. Anonymous said in 1837 about Texas prairies. I will take the liberty while our horses are feeding upon the plain to make a general retrospect since our departure from Houston. We had now traveled about 18 miles, and if we accept the woods upon Bray's Bayou, which is too inconsiderable in quantity and kind to deserve notice, the whole country is timberless. We could, to be sure, now and then see a small grove of stunted oak scattered over the plain, but which see nothing more than resting places for the fowls of the air or a lounging place for an ox during the heat of the day. Between the San Jacinto and the Brazos lies uh, upon a continued plain which down to the gulf and up to the mountains is only interrupted either way by the sight of timber some, as some bayou or tributary stretches into the prairie. This plain is spread out and becomes more extended as you ascend to the heads of the streams where the country is lost in a boundless prairie. The country between the two streams is a uniform level and, and that portion of which lies 200 miles between the Gulf during the wet seasons is almost impassable for either man or horse. Um, there's a couple of things in here that I think are kind of interesting. Uh, one is that uh, 
the only place that you had trees for the most part, there are some exceptions, was along a water course, a creek or a stream or a bayou. Other than that, what you're talking about is you're talking about great fields of grass that could stretch for miles and miles and miles. The farther north and the farther west you went, the larger those areas became and the more spread out that uh, these came. Uh, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but water. Where do you get water on a place where there's no water? Hmm, that's curious. Yeah. If there aren't any streams, there aren't any trees, where's the water come from? How are you going to survive out there? Resuming, uh, resuming the journey, we followed the timber uh, two miles north. It seems singular at, that the boundary between the prairie and the timberland should be so distinctly defined for one ceased and the other commenced with an abruptness that looked like more the work of man than the hand of nature. Have you seen that? Have you seen those edges? Uh, you can still see them hiding here and there. Uh, we're, uh, as people, we're doing our best to kind of obscure those, but, but at one time you could almost draw a line along where the trees began and the, and the grasslands ended or vice versa. We now turned left and entered the timber of the Brazos because the river bottoms are going to have trees in them. These dense cane breaks and massive timber covered with rich foliage making a continuous arbor impenetrable to the sun that formed a marked contrast with the treeless and sunlit prairie. What a place. Uh, such contrast, um, and I and what people did back then is they sought the shelter of the woods, the the trees. Frederick Law Olmsted came to Texas. Uh, he's he, has anybody ever heard of Central Park in New York? Well, he's the guy who designed it. Uh, it, it I've never been there, but I think it's probably pretty impressive. Uh, he came to Texas in 1856-57, and this is one of the things that he said about Texas. Uh, we looked out in the morning upon a real sea of wet grass. A dead flat extended as far as the eye uh, could reach, reeking with water. The rain fell in sheets and the wind blew a gale from the southward, but we were anxious to reach the coast and sheathing ourselves in hampers and India rubber, we uh, put off in the face of the blast. We had come a long way off the road to find the plantation and on leaving our host, he gave us some advice on how to find the road again. Advice not at all unnecessary for we might easily have lost all traces of our whereabouts on the limitless expanse before us and have furnished another example uh, mentioned in the visit of Texas and I'll talk about that in a minute. Directions are as follows. This is what the man told him to do. The wind is now at the south and it will likely stay so. Well, you keep the wind right square on your shoulder and ride straight across the prairie and when you've gone about a mile, you will rise to the tops of some timber. Then you go right toward that until you see the bottoms of the trees and when you see the ground where they grow, then you bear off to the right of them till you see the road. You think you could follow directions like that? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, it, it wouldn't be impossible, but it would be a little tricky. Okay. Uh, uh, the road was a mere collection of straggling uh, wagon ruts extending for more than a quarter of a mile in width and going from outside to outside. Romer said that we had heard that two parties who had wished to meet each other had passed on the road and they didn't even see each other. They passed right by each other because it was so wide. They were trying to dodge the ruts and the mud holes. One had taken to the right side of the road and the other had taken to the left and they, they totally passed each other. Uh, we met uh, 17 wagons and 9 Mexican carts upon the road and 10 cotton wagons bound to the coast. Laid up uh, in stress of weather, the Teamsters huddled in pitiful plight under their slight protection. It's almost forgotten now, but watercourses in Texas, rivers and streams and bayous like Buffalo Bayou, were really, 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 underline again, really important to people being able to get around here. Uh, especially in the wet season, which generally lasts six to nine months. If you try to carry a wagon across the prairie, good luck. If you don't do it in the right time of the year, you're going to leave your wagon buried to the axles in the mud. Uh, you un 
and take all your worldly possessions off of it, get the wagon unstuck from the mud, put all your worldly possessions back on it, and go another 20 feet and you're stuck in the mud again. Uh, it's not unlikely that these wagons, these Mexican carts and cotton wagons stayed there until summertime when the ground dried out enough uh, for them to, to get back. Now you remember me saying earlier that prairies were dry places, you have to on the prairie, where do you get water? Well, it's feast or famine. Sometimes there's more water than you know what to do with, and therefore mud beyond belief. But there are other times when it is dry, 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 all reminiscent of a desert. Uh, you remember, uh, Romer had referred to a guy, uh, well, he referred to a guy, and this guy that he was referring to is named Daniel Baker. And in 1831, Daniel Baker got lost. And it was right here in this area on the coastal plains, actually. It didn't occur somewhere in the, the north, uh, Nebraska. It happened here. This is what Daniel Baker had to say about his experience. He said, bewildered in the uh, wild and trackless prairie, I was lost, lost, lost. After wandering about in every direction, my Self and horse without water for 30 hours, I began to seriously think that I should have to lie down and die in this untraveled wilderness, far away from my family and the habitation of men, without a friend to close my eyes or dig my grave. Uh, Daniel Baker survived, uh, hence he wrote this. Uh, the interesting part about that is and Daniel Baker was riding on the prairie and he was getting a little concerned. He was lost. He didn't know what direction to go for Pete's sake. As far as he could see, everywhere he looked, it was grass and grass and grass. And suddenly, he comes upon somebody's trail. I can see where, where a, a horse has walked through the grass. Aha, I follow this and it will take me to uh, a habitation. It will take me to people and take me to survival. And so he starts following it. And he follows it for a great distance and then suddenly he discovers that somebody met up with that guy on the horse. And now there are two of them going down the trail. So he'll follow all two of them. When he came around a third time, he realized he was following his own trail. Uh, eventually he's going to be discovered but the point I'm trying to make is that the prairies were so vast and people have a tendency to walk in circles when they get lost they don't they don't really realize it but you do you, you travel in circles exactly why I'm not sure but um, they did well, we're talking about the vastness and the bigness of this place and, and how could somebody get lost out there well uh, there are other people that made references to the prairies being like seas and I it's just Amazing. Uh, a guy named Charles Seals Field in 1832 said, It was a boundless ocean of grass with islands of trees. Oceans of grass. If you've ever been in a place where the grasses are so high and so thick and when the wind blows they bend over and, and they behave almost like waves on an ocean. Um, and then suddenly for people to think of trees as being islands in an ocean. What trees are Trees aren't an island. Trees are trees. But to this guy, if you're in the middle of the ocean, what is a what is an island of trees? It's safe haven. It's a place where you can go and you can be rescued and nurtured. But you can't do that on the sea of grass. You've got to go to those islands of trees. Here's Olmsted again uh, in 1856-57. Ten or twelve miles towards the north and northwest, a few dark masses were to be seen, which we took for islands, as in truth they are called, and characteristically enough, for they resemble them exactly. They actually looked like islands sitting out there in a sea of grass. But that metaphor is used so many, many times. You've heard seas of grass. I'm not, I'm, practically everybody has. Well, if you haven't, you have now. Uh, amber waves of grain. You ever heard that that phrase? Amber waves of grain. Islands of trees. Of course, oh, I think I've even used that term from time to time. Prairie schooners. I don't know if they teach about prairie schooners in American history in the fourth or third grade or whatever it is. But when I was a kid, prairie schooners were a big deal. Uh, prairie schooners were big wagons. 
wagons that were pulled by oxen or cattle and they, they were curved on the front and the back. They had a bow and a stern and then you put a canvas top over it and that billows in the wind and generally they're whitish. The, the grass is so tall all you see is the bow and the stern. You don't even see the cattle down there pulling the wagon and suddenly of this sea of grass there's this wagon that looks just like a ship on the sea. It's amazing. Oh, bury me not on the lone prairie. I wish I had time to uh, read you the, the words, the lyrics to that song. Most of us have heard, Oh, bury me not on the lone prairie. If you listen to the song, it'll break your heart because the guy, he's sick, he's hurt, he's going to die on the prairie and he doesn't want to be buried there. He wants to be buried near friends and family. Uh, I just wonder how many thousands, and I mean thousands, of people uh, were left on those prairies. Uh, not even enough wood to make a cross to mark their grave. Emmanuel Dominique uh, said, My soul was filled with the immensity of the picture is on the ocean. Here's Olmsted again. The land seemed to melt into the Gulf of Mexico on one side and into the horizon on the other. The ground swells were so long and so equal in height and similar as to bring uh, in form as to bring to mind a tedious sea voyage where you go plodding on slow after hour after slow hour without raising a single object to attract the eyes. The only way, much like at sea, the only way that you knew that you were getting anywhere is if you happened to look back and you could see that your wagon and your animals were leaving the track in the prairie. Rutherford B. Hayes was the 19th president of the United States. We've had a few since then, but he wrote in his journal in 1880, I love this, he was in Texas, ride over a level, boundless prairie out of sight of land. Hello, Rutherford, you're the president. Yes, you're riding on a level, boundless prairie, but you're not out of sight of land. Uh, what does land mean to you? It means trees, it means habitation. Uh, bless your heart. Has anybody here ever been to Galveston, or anybody who's listening ever been to Galveston? Most of you have, and so picture in your mind's eye what, what Galveston looks like. You come off the causeway, and yeah, okay, I can see that, oleanders and such. Uh, and uh, I think it was 1842, 32, Charles Sealsfield said, it is called Galveston Island, but has neither hill nor valley, neither house nor farm, not even a tree with the exception of three stunted trees at the western end, but which through the extreme flatness of the ground are visible from a great distance. In 1837, there were only seven houses on the island. Uh, the Mexicans, when this was part of Mexico, wouldn't allow settlers to settle within 20 leagues of the coast. So you couldn't, you couldn't live on Galveston Island legally um, because of customs and taxes and smuggling and all that. They didn't want that to happen. Um, 1842, William Bollard. On approaching its shores, it seems very low and uninteresting, but there are landmarks such as the three trees, which are a collection of small trees, 11 in one group and two single ones, about the center of the island and houses along the beach. The sailors, the seamen, the captains, would use those trees as landmarks because the ocean blended into the grass with the waves and so forth. Uh, they had to be, they were watching for those trees because they knew when they saw those they were going to be very near land. Otherwise, they wouldn't know land was anywhere near. Um, 1849, a guy named Ferdinand Romer. Uh, the tall grass covers the flat surface as far as the eye can see, and there are no trees on the island except three live oaks. Those trees are still there. Hmm. Three live oaks. Do you guys remember more than three trees on Galveston Island? Anybody ever heard of a place called Morgan's Point? Not everybody has. It's a little teeny tiny town that lives right behind La Porte on Galveston Bay. And a fellow named uh, James Morgan uh, created a settlement there and it ultimately became um, Morgan's Point. Mr. Romer went to visit him and um, he'd come across Galveston Bay and this is what he had to say about seeing a Texas prairie for the first time. And we're talking right here where we are, folks. We're not talking, you know, 
Saskatchewan or Nebraska or South Dakota. He said, after passing through a forest, remember there's always going to be some trees where there's water, I had my first view of a Texas prairie. An unbroken, level, grassy plain extended for miles before us on which a few islands of trees and shrubs were scattered in a regular order. A level prairie in the rear of the farm as far as the eye could see. As far as the eye could see. Colonel Morgan was going to take uh, Mr. Romer on a bear hunt because you see there were still a lot of bears in this area. The bears are gone uh, to say the least. And if I could take just a little sidebar, I like to do this because I like the little history stuff too. Uh, why are all the bears gone? Why did they kill bears every time they saw them? <laughs> no. Oh, there's a bear. Let's kill it. Well, first of all, you're a manly man if you can kill a bear. Of course, you know, and it gives you some points right there. I killed the bear. But more, more often than not, and also there's the thing about, well, they kill my livestock. We can't have that. Uh, same reason that they would kill chicken hawks. But um, the main reason that they killed the bear is for the commodities that they could get from the bear. The meat, yeah, it was an acquired taste, to say the least. Uh, you got the fur. You could use that for a variety of things. But the main thing was the grease. The grease from the bear was... <laughs> Invaluable. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but it was very, very important. I'll give you an example. You got a wagon. Your wagon's got a wooden wheel on it, right? Because they didn't have rubber tires back then. So you got a wooden wheel on your wagon. Guess what your axle's made out of? Wood. What happens when you rub two sticks together long enough? What happens? You get fire. Now here you are, you're riding in your wagon, da -da -da, I'm on the prairie, da -da -da -da. suddenly your axle's on fire and you're setting the prairie on fire behind you. Not a good idea. So what we're going to do is we're going to lubricate that axle with something greasy. Okay, now what are we going to get? Hmm, whale oil? Well, we're kind of far away from the ocean. And we don't want to kill the whales anyway, right? Wink, wink. Uh, so what we do is we use that bear grease. And that bear grease was good for lubricating. It was also good for cooking. You could, you could, it never went bad. It never soured like pig fat, pig grease would. Uh, and you could even slick your hair back with it when you went to town on Saturday night. It was, it was, you know, it was just great stuff. While I'm talking about bears, here's another one. This is kind of one of those things I like to throw out there and kind of poke you with. Uh, why do the grizzly bears live in the mountains? They never lived down here this far south, but why do grizzly bears live in the mountains? I'll tell you, since you can't answer me. Uh, grizzly bears live in the mountains because that's the only place they have left to live. At one point, there was a race or a species of grizzly bear that lived on the Great Plains. Hello? Grizzly bears don't always have to live in the mountains. And speaking of bears, let's talk about buffalo. 32 million of them at one point in time. Or at least so they say. They could have been even more than that. I mean, nobody really counted them. I mean, it's the best guess thing, huh? What happened to all the buffaloes? Where'd they go? Well, we killed them. Yeah, we killed them, all right. Well, why did we kill them? Well, you're going to hear a lot of people say, and please forgive me, I don't mean anything disrespectful here, but a lot of people will tell you, well, they killed the Indians so they, uh, they killed the buffalo so they could remove the Indians. And, yeah, I'm sure that probably had something to do with it in a lot of people's minds. But the real reason probably didn't have anything to do with the Native Americans. I think probably what it had to do with is money. You know, if you usually look deep enough, you'll find uh, the motivation is money. Uh, if they kill 32 million buffaloes, they stopped killing them when there was between three and 3,000. Nobody's exactly sure, but there was a really small number of buffaloes left when they actually stopped killing them. Uh, what happened to all those, those buffalo parts? Um, they took them for the hides primarily. Where are all the hides? Shouldn't At 32 million, even though the 100 years has passed, wouldn't you think there'd be a few of them around? Yeah, there's one or two in a museum here, one or two in a museum there. There ought to be more than that. One would think, at least I would. Well, you see, they weren't made for coats. The skins, the hides weren't made for coats. Uh, or 
or things like that. Their skins were used to make belts. Not belts that you wear around your waist, but belts to drive machines. This was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. You had water wheels, you had steam engines, you had all kinds of engines that needed to transfer the energy from the engine to the machine. And how did you do that? You did it with a belt, a big, long belt that twisted and in in, as the machine engine turned, it turned the machine. And that, I believe, is where most of your buffalo went. It didn't have any, it had to do with money. It had to do with cash. They could get money for those. Uh, for those of you who live on the southwest side, uh, between around February the 1820, uh, a lady named Mrs. Rabb had a farm over in, in Fort Bend County, what's now Richmond Rosenberg. You have 59, you'll actually, if you look real quick and you don't blink, you'll see a little sign there that says Rabb's Bayou. Uh, she had 3,000 head of buffalo across her property uh, in 1820, and when they got through with it, it, it was February, so it was muddy, obviously, and it looked like it been turned up with a, a plow. Uh, Henry Jutel uh, was one of LaSalle's gang in 1684. They were here before the Spanish were, by the way. Uh, he referred to uh, the area as beautiful grasses are here serving as pasturage to an infinite number of bison. Now, where he was located was near Victoria, Texas. That's where Fort St. Louis was. Now, Victoria, Texas is south of Houston considerably. There were infinite numbers of bison there in 1684. Speaking of other wildlife, um, Here's a couple of quotes from that area. We found the bottoms of the Brazos and Oyster Creek, animals of nearly all kinds from the, listen to this now, the large spotted leopard to the little cottontail, what we generally call the rabbit in this country, and several species of squirrels such as fox and gray and flying squirrels and bears and panthers and leopard cats and wild cats. Now, this guy, Sealsfield, I think who this is, named four different kinds of cats. He named large spouted leopard. What do you think that was? Jaguar. Hmm. Also, then he names panthers. I wonder, panther, I'm thinking he's probably talking cougar. Since we don't have mountains here, I'm not going to call it a mountain lion, but it's all the same critter. Leopard cats. Hmm, I wonder what a leopard cat is. He refers to it as a cat, and it's a leopard. Could that be an ocelot? Is it possible? Up here? I mean, he's talking about the Brazos River and, and Oyster Creek. Oyster Creek used to be the Brazos River until 1,500 years ago. It changed its course and became the Brazos. And, yeah. and wildcats. Wildcats, I suspect, were, were uh, cats we call Bob. Bobcat? Yeah, I bet those were Bobcats. I do know for a fact that in Jasper County, which is up in East Texas, in 1907, up until very recently, that was the, the last recorded evidence of a jaguar in Texas. It was killed in 1907 in Jasper County. That is so far north and east of us, it's almost unbelievable that a leopard could be there. Now, if leopards are in Jasper County, let me tell you, they were in these river bottoms down here. Here's another one. We crossed the San Bernard stream about two miles from the San Bernard Valley in which we saw a small drove of buffaloes. They ran off before we got to kill any of them. And all I can say to that is all oh, shucks. Mm -hmm. um, Mrs. Rab, of course, I told you about. Um, the prairie was also full of potholes. Potholes are what we call just low spots in the prairie, and they fill with water. And let me tell you, when they fill with water, in the bad old days, and really to some extent today, if, uh, if they can find them, they will literally fill with ducks and geese. Uh, Sandhill cranes, whooping cranes, Atwater's prairie chickens would be on the edges of it, you know, where the buffaloes had wallowed out a, a, a booming ground for them on a, a Mima Mound or a Pimple Mound. That's where they would be. Uh, the uh, prairie was abundant and it really would, maybe you've heard this term, maybe you haven't, the birds could literally block out this sun. They would be so numerous. Mr. Romer, again, uh, you live in Houston? Anybody here? You ever been to Houston? It's okay. 
Uh, this is what Mr. Romer had to say about getting to and from Houston. Hardly had we left the city of Houston when the flat Houston Prairie, I suspect he's talking about the Katy Prairie, but it could be anywhere, bloomed up as an endless swamp. Large puddles of water followed one another, and at several places, large sections of land were underwater. Darkness, does the Katy Prairie ever get wet? Who to thunk it? Uh, darkness fell, and we still had not reached the end of the prairie, nor did we find a dry place to lie down. Next morning, we proceeded on our journey, and we were confronted with the same obstacles we met on the previous day. Night again overtook us in a wet prairie where not a stick of wood could be found to kindle a fire. Assuming it wasn't really wet, assuming it was a dry time, you know what you could use for making the fire. Buffalo chips. And if you don't know what buffalo chips are, ask somebody. Uh, Olmsted said this about uh, the Houston prairies. He, in his uh, journal, he said, Road, Roads bad and rains. Noon. Uh, got to Mr. Smith's and Mr. Phipps uh, got on the sulky and some 10 or 12 miles on the road it was broken to pieces. And Phipps had a narrow escape of serious injury. Left the sulky in the road to be brought to Houston. Roads were awful. And why were the roads so bad? <laughs> Well, they were bad because they were mud. And they were either uh, clay soil or they were muddy bogs. And uh, imagine a land, and this is the way coastal Texas is, and prairies for the most part. Imagine a land where there are more birds' nests than there are stones. All the stone, all the rock, all the hard things that you see that we make roads out of here uh, came from somewhere else. Uh, right here on the coast, uh, if guys wanted to make a real road, what they would use would be oyster shell. And Romer says, in the entire level plains of Texas, he's exaggerating a bit, no rock is found. So all those rocks are gone. I'm almost done here. You guys have been very patient with me. Thank you. Uh, Galleria forests and cane breaks. Those are those forests that are along the edges of the prairies where the water courses are. Uh, they're called Galleria forests in some cases. And underneath those, and then sometimes stretching out into the prairies, were cane breaks. And cane breaks were immense in their proportions. What's a cane break? Well, a, it's a grass that looks like bamboo uh, and grows very tall and straight and grows really, really thick and it can be very dense. And it usually grows in the bottoms and once again stretches out into the prairies. And how many people have ever heard of anything in coastal Texas referred to as Caney Creek? Every creek you see in Texas at one time was probably called Caney Creek because it was covered in a Rundinaria gigantea, which is the, was the native cane, and then of course some others as well. But this one particular cane break uh, was a uh, fellow says that he goes 70 miles, scarcely a tree to be seen the entire surface, and the cane was 20 to 20 feet high, 20 to 25 feet high. It goes for 70 miles, and it stretches out three to five miles away from the river bottoms. The cane uh, also lined the understory, uh, which rich prairie grass, uh, beautiful golden sage that spread out over the western hills. What, here's uh, Romer again. What renders a greater danger still is the frequency of cane breaks or tracts of land overgrown with long reeds, which we make fishing poles in the northern states. These canes grow in some places among the forest trees, uh, so to think as to render a passage through them inconvenient and more often found occupying alone a considerable tract of almost impenetrable by man as well as any other terrestrial object. Uh, this was where the bad guys used to hide in the cane breaks. Um, in the early, early days, what you found in cane breaks were black bear, rattlesnakes, and outlaws. Uh, they were pretty scary places. Uh, Brazoria, Texas is not too far from Texas, down towards the coast, and it was a it was a major city in colonial Texas, to say the least. And uh, there was a guy that stayed at an inn there overnight, and he wandered out in the cane breaks, just a little curiosity, I suppose. He, obviously, he, did, he hadn't been in Texas very long, or he'd known better. Uh, uh, and he got lost, and he had to spend the night in the cane break because he couldn't find his way out. Um, Another quote is, it took us uh, three entire days to make 30 miles from the mouth of the Brazos to the Brazoria. 
three days to travel from Brazoria, Texas to Freeport, Texas. If you get out a map and you look and you see the distance there, uh, it makes you wonder. Uh, people measure time differently than we do now. So, maybe now you got a little bit of an idea of what the prairies were like, but I'm not sure I even do. When I was a kid, the development, that was a long time ago, uh, the, kid, uh, the change hadn't begun to happen as rapidly as it, it was now. I can remember when Chinese talent trees were a little bit of an oddity, and they weren't everywhere, and now what they've taken, they've done is they've consumed every available space that used to be prairie. So, in my mind, I, I can still see a little bit of what the land was like when when the guys came here 150 years ago. Um, so, but hopefully, what I've helped you do is see the same thing. The question I now would ask would be, what happened to the prairies? Where'd they go? I'm not trying to put guilt on anybody or blame. I'm just going to tell you the facts as I see them. Uh, the first one is agriculture. Uh, grazing and, and overgrazing has done a number on the native grasses here. Uh, even before there were fences, uh, there, was, there were cases of overgrazing. Of course, uh, post-Civil War, uh, barbed wire, uh, affectionately referred to in Texas as bob wire, uh, confine the livestock to local places and of course the livestock are going to, to eat their first choice foods which are the native grasses and then they're going to go eat their second choice food and as soon as the first choice food emerges from the ground just a couple of inches they're going to go back over there and eat that then they're going to eat their third choice food uh, uh, look there's a quarter of an inch of first choice food over there I'm going to go eat that and so what they do they uh, the cattle and notably horses uh, really can do a number on rangeland prairie land. Uh, farming, of course, uh, we converted a lot of uh, prairie land to uh, agriculture, and the reason is, man, you come here and you don't, you don't even have to move rocks. And the very first day you get here, you can... A settler would not spend 10 years cutting down and burning trees. On the very day of his arrival, he could put his plow into the ground and he could hear the sod ripping. Okay. When, I, when I say that, I hear the sod, it's to me that you could hear the sod screaming. Ah, this has never happened to me before. What's going on? Uh, the sod is all gone now, uh, to say the least. Another thing that happened is in the 1830s, a fellow named uh, John Deere uh, came up with this thing all steel plow is what they called it, but actually it was the mold board on the plow was steel. And what that enabled them to do was plow through some serious stuff. If you had enough oxen or mules on the end of your plow, uh, you could turn the earth, to say the least. And to give you an example of uh, uh, how thick sod was on prairies, a mass of a square, a half a meter, I think that would be probably about a half meter square, half meter by half meter by half meter, uh, a big blue stem sod contains nearly 13 miles of fine hairs and rootlets in it. 13 miles in just a little section like that. Uh, farming and developments, uh, byproducts. Uh, when we start the farming and, what, uh, and we start developing areas, uh, there's no place for that water to go. That water that stood on the prairies and sheep flowed for, for days and weeks at a time, finding the nearest creek or stream, uh, now gets to, uh, to flood areas. And, and the grasses slowed the rainwater. They slowed it down considerably. And of course, when the rainwater's gone and the grasses are gone and the prairies are gone, well then for the most part the ducks and geese are gone as well. In the part of the, the world where I worked as a ranger for the longest time, when I first got there, I used to go to a couple of places where there was water and I'd see I'd see the geese flying overhead, you know, by the thousands. And uh, they turned it into a landfill and you know what? The geese and ducks aren't there anymore. Which brings me to another point. Uh, you know, when the geese fly, they always fly in the V formation. And, and invariably, uh, one side of that V formation is longer than the other. And you know why. There's more birds on that side. <laughs> okay, so... Um, these new lands of Texas merely require scraping and a crop of corn or cotton comes up in the first year. In the majority of the locations, clearing the land is not necessary. Well, it's not necessary because there are any trees on it. 
Of course, guess what? We have what are called invasives and exotics. Can you name one? Uh, if you've been around for uh, people like me any length of time, you've probably heard of one or two. Um, the tallow that shall not be named. Uh, Johnson grass, um, K.R. Blue Stem, Vassy grass, Vassy grass, however you want to say it, McCartney rose, the list goes on and on and it continues to grow. Um, also, uh, suppression of fire, um, fire bad. Humans don't like fire, especially if it's wild. So uh, what we've done is every time we see a fire, the first our first response is, put it out, put it out. And we've done a pretty good job of that. And the fire is something that's very natural and important to uh, a lot of ecosystems, and especially a prairie one. Uh, i got a pop quiz for you. Uh, uh, say if you were 150, 200 years ago, you're out on the prairie, you're traveling along, you've got all your worldly possessions, your family's with you, you're in the wagon, uh, and you look ahead of you, and what you see suddenly is the red buffalo. The red buffalo is what Native Americans refer to as wildfire. The wildfire, the red buffalo, is coming to you at a rapid rate. It's just, it, let's say for, it's traveling as fast as the wind is blowing, and it's traveling, the wind's blowing at 15 miles an hour. You can't run 15 miles an hour. The fire is coming towards you. It stretches from horizon to horizon, and it's coming, and it's coming, and it's coming. What are you going to do? Well, I've had some people say, well, uh, I'd try to just bend over and just blow right through it. It's about eight, 900 degrees Fahrenheit. The animals probably ain't going to go for that. You, uh, and, uh, well, I dig a hole. Well, you're going to dig a hole deep enough to bury your whole wagon and your animals. And uh, Well, I try to outrun. I turn around and go to it. No, you can't outrun it. You cannot go. Well, I go around. No, it stretches from horizon to horizon. What do you do? What do you do? What you do is you start a fire behind you. And as, as, the, um, as the fire burns, it's going to burn in a cone, in kind of a triangular shape, and it's going to create a black space behind you. And then you go into that back black space, and when the buffalo comes to where the black where you started the fire, what it'll do is there's no fuel there to support it, so it'll go around you. Um, and that's how you'll save your life. Uh, Prairie Survival 101. Another thing, I, before I forget, because uh, I wanted to talk to you uh, about the prairies and ocean, and then I'll get back to my topic at hand. Imagine what it would be like to take all your worldly goods and possessions and put them on a, like a 16 or a 20 foot boat, and say, "Okay, now I'm going to cross the Atlantic Ocean." If you can, th if you can do that, and think that you could have the courage to do that, then you begin to have some sort of an understanding of what it was like when these people broke out of the forests of the eastern part of the United States, and they were confronted with the Great Plains. Uh, traveling out there was going to be very, very similar to an ocean voyage of maybe a thousand, two thousand miles. It required a lot of courage, and it was very, very dangerous. So, uh, we've pretty much done a number on the prairies. I've told you that uh, there's um, you know, less than one-tenth of one percent left, and uh, you can check me on that. No. I'm not afraid to stand behind that one. Um, well, what can we do? Well, we can save what we can, the little pieces, the remnants that are here and there. We can save those. Uh, we save them what we can, we save them when we can. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. The bulldozers are out there. The property belongs to somebody else, and all you can do is just... You save it where you can. Uh, uh, and then what you do is you interpret the remnants that you have. You interpret those remnants just like you would interpret the Alamo or Gettysburg. Uh, you tell people about about the lives and the tears and the suffering and you remember. Because if we don't remember, then we can't expect anybody else to remember as well. I want to leave you with a little bit of uh, Carl Sandburg. Um, here the water bit down, the iceberg slid gravel, the gaps in the valley hisses and the black loam and the yellow sandy loam. 
here between the sheds of the Rocky Mountains and the Appalachians. Here now a morning star fixes a fire sign over timber claims and cow pastures, the corn belt and the cattle ranches. Here the gray geese go 500 miles and back with a wind under their wings honking for the cry of a new home. Here I know I will hanker after nothing so many as one more sunrise or sky moon of fire doubled to a river moon over water. The prairie song sings to me in the forenoon and I know in the night I rest easy in the prairie's arms on the prairie heart. This struggle between uh, trees and grass and people uh, is one of the grimmest conflicts that's ever been engaged in this hemisphere uh, between two plant communities. Uh, sometimes the trees win, sometimes the grass wins. Uh, and it's been going on for about 25 million years. Well, it's been a long time. They don't seem to ever be able to come to any kind of agreement or understanding. Right now, I would say, at least from my perspective, and I hope I'm wrong, the trees are winning. And I'm not sure the grasses can recover. And this has happened over a broad battlefront, and it's seen countless victories on both sides. Uh, it hasn't seen human intervention in exotics to the extent that we see today, so that may tip the scales. But these intrusions of glacial epochs and corn farmers are just basically interludes, and uh, they'll likely continue for a long, long time after we're gone. So, take heart. I've had fun talking to you about this. There's so much more I'd like to share, but I think I'll probably run my course for right now. Uh, maybe you can take something away from this. If I have provoked you to think about prairies in a new or a different way, then I've done my job. The only other thing that I would ask is that, is that if you've learned anything from this, don't keep it to yourself. Give it away. Pass it forward. Give it to somebody else. Remember, we have to remember. Have a good day. Take care. We'll see you on the prairies. Bye-bye.